<laughs> okay. Well, welcome, bienvenidos to Radio Boise. Um, I was talking to Sonia earlier, and she said it's really fun being popular. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is a testament to that. This is by far the most people we've ever had at a couch surfer event, so we really appreciate you guys coming by. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So I'm Wayne Bird, I'm the program director, and we, Christian and I, Christian Wynn, started Couch Surfer. This is the beginning of our third year at Radio Boise. Third year at Radio Boise, yeah. yeah so. And so we can feel it gain in traction. Some months, you know, there are 15 or 20 people, some people, some months more, and this is really the kind of momentum that we've been working for for a long time. And not because we're looking for fame and glory necessarily, right? But we just want everyone that wants to participate in democratic community radio to have the opportunity to do it. So for that purpose, if you know maybe this is the event that helps Radio Boise come on your radar, don't forget about us. I'm the program director. You can harangue me anytime you like. Mm -hmm. Show ideas, coming in and volunteering, any of that stuff. This is also the inauguration of our new space. Um, which is a lot bigger than the last space. I can tell you we would have had to turn one third of you away because it was just in that little performance area. Um, and we are in the middle, of course, of raising money for that. We do have a fun drive coming up on October 2nd. It's October 2nd through the 11th. Um, give us a thought, maybe, you know, if you have 20 bucks laying around or something like that. It sort of keeps this going, and we promise that we will operate in good faith to keep the place open to everybody. So thank you all for coming. Um, one little note, uh, make sure you turn your cell phones off because we're recording, it'll interfere with the recording. And I also want to give a shout out to the video team, Tara, Scott, Jenny, Jared, Robert, and also our engineer, Speedy, who selflessly comes in every month between September and February and helps us execute these things. We run around, we look a little chaotic, but we're really pros. <laughs> All right, so the fellow that does so much for literary and the arts in the community of Boise, Christian. Thanks, Wayne. Um, I won't be long with this, but uh, thank you. I just echo you know, many sentiments that uh, Wayne just laid out there. And um, yeah, I think there are raffle tickets for sale for the electric car this year, by the way. I think it's 20, 25 bucks. So at halftime or afterwards you can inquire about such things and help support the state. It's going to be a little bit balmy in here, it's all right, but um, five fantastic women involved with our kickoff, you know, event of the season. So I'm just going to introduce Amanda Ramp, who's one of our, one of my favorite people to work with and have done some stuff with at uh, Story Fort and at uh, Campfire Stories, and I'm so stoked that you're here to do the moderating for your first moderating gig even on the other side, but now <laughs> you get to be in charge. So I'm just going to give you her brief bio, and uh, then she's going to introduce the rest of uh, the women. So Amanda Ranth is an activist, poet, performer, and visual artist whose background in street theater and community education propels her to create poems that are enlivened and participatory. She enjoys blurring the lines between poetry and music, performer and audience, she is the author of several chapbooks, including Seeds and Sleepless Nights and Skinless Woman. Her work has been showcased in Queer Gathering of Nations in Albuquerque, New Mexico, One Flaming Arrow, an intertribal inter art music and film festival in Portland, Oregon, Ming Gallery, Story Fort, and the Boise Art Museum's Tall Tales exhibit. Amanda also facilitates poetry and story storytelling workshops um, across the Treasure Valley. An Idaho native, Native, she currently resides in Nampa, where she wanders the edges of wilderness with the Cooper's hawks and swallow tails. <laughs> so, there we go. I'll move to the back and let right. you take Thank it away. Thank you, Christian. Well, welcome everyone for being here. Um, this is my first time moderating and hosting, so the caveat is you are on a journey of experimental uh, performance and conversation with us. And I'm gonna do things a little bit different. Um, rather than introducing everyone at once, I'm gonna walk you through a little bit at a time. And um, before we jump into the program, I just wanted to uh, do a land acknowledgement, which is that we are currently on the land of seven tribes, including the Shoshone Bannock, the Paiute, the Ute, the Weezer River tribe, the Nez Pierce, and 
um, this place was called Kopala, which was Cottonwood Gathering Place, and I like to do a land acknowledgement before my readings and before my hostings. And also thank all of our ancestors who've come before us and who have enabled us to be here and enable us to be the women that we are sitting together this evening. I feel very fortunate to share this space uh, with you all. Um, come on in. And uh, we are going to be a mix of art and activism today. And I kind of came up with a little title for our uh, program, which is Women Breaking the Mold and breaking ground in art and activism. And that's a quote that Sonia said in our last meeting that I really loved. So we are going to start with Riley Johnson, who is our musician today. And Riley is a multi-instrumentalist musician, composer and piano instructor from Boise. After picking up the harp in 2016, she became entirely enamored with the instrument and started her own project, WEND, a sometimes seven plus piece chamber psych band known for genre bending beauty and melodies. Johnson is also a member of local bands like Regular Sounds and Purring Mantis as a singer, keyboardist, and drummer. And on a personal note, um, about a month ago I put a call out for a musician to do a reading poetry music combo and she was the brave soul who volunteered to be um, impromptu working together about an hour before the performance and I really felt like we had a beautiful connection not just personally but also in the kind of art that we create so I'd like to hand over the platform to Riley to start us off. Thank you.
of you can't see or who might be listening to the program later, it's incredible to watch how Riley plays her instrument and then is also manipulating all these loop and effects pedals at her feet. It's a true talent, so it's really amazing to witness. Um, well, I would like to now introduce uh, Sonia Rosario, who is the founder of the Women of Color Alliance, a nonprofit working with women from rural Idaho and reservations on economic and leadership development. She's a documentary filmmaker who was a military brat who lived in Texas, Italy, Netherlands, and Azores before settling in Idaho in 1994. Growing up in different cultures, Rosario used these experiences to learn the real value of community and relationship building as she grew into a grassroots organizer. Today, her films cover the identities of gender, ethnicity, indigeneity, environment, and relationship. Her last project, The Sofa Diaries, is a moving series of interviews with women talking about the impact and ripple effect of powerful women in their lives. And she has done those interviews in her documentary on the exact same sofa that we have here today in the studio. Um, on a personal note, I first met Sonia when I was probably 19 or 20 years old. And You're aging me. <laughs> <laughs> and we were working under the same roof um, for you know different nonprofits housed in one office, and I you know, was enamored with her, looking up to her a lot in those days, and uh, still really unsure of who I was as a person, but I was like, that's who I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> You're aging me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, uh, Sonia, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about your film, and then I have a question for you okay. and Riley before we introduce all of our beautiful guests today. Okay. Well, the sofa came about after my mother passed away in 2010. I um, stayed in San Antonio to hear about her as a girl, and I wanted to get that reflection of her as a young woman, because I always said to her, you don't get me, you don't understand me, you don't know, you never were young. And she'd look at me and go, wait and see. But I did not know how much I'd fall in love with her after she died. And so if you have your mothers, pull out your phone and interview her. That's really critical because you get the story from the person who lived it and you have a legacy left behind. But the sofa happened because I walked into uh, my home one day. I had been married already three years and my mother looked distraught. And um, I asked her what was wrong and we sat on the sofa and she said that she was leaving my father after 36 years of a, an abusive relationship that had fallen into the status of loveless. And she asked me for support. She didn't ask me to teach her or to tell her how to do it. She just said, will you be there for me? And I said, together we will divorce our abuser and we will, um, we will divorce a way of thinking a way of old acceptance of a lifestyle that no longer fitted or fits the modern woman today. So we took a journey together. She died in 2010. I took this sofa which, where she told me that she'd leave my father, put it in my Chevy van, and off I went to Blackfoot, Idaho, and began the Sofa Diaries there. It was birth in Blackfoot, Idaho, and I will forever be thankful to Blackfoot, Idaho for opening its doors to me. But um, it's been an incredible journey. It's been a long road. Um, what I'd love to hear is that women actually, when I'm pulling up with the Chevy and everybody knows she's in the Chevy, <laughs> they go, Gloria's here, Gloria's here. Because I named my sofa, sofa after my mother, Gloria. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yeah. So um, one question I have for you and for Riley, our artists um, today in the room, is about process because as a writer myself, I always love to hear about other people's process. As a filmmaker, also as a poet, and Riley is a musician and songwriter, you know, how, what sparks creativity for you and how do you go from those raw materials to a finished product? I, th I think as an artist and probably Many of my girlfriends, and my husband included, will agree that um, there's a sense of nostalgia, a sense of melancholy, 
I don't use the word depression. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a Western name that I do not agree for myself. I don't like that word. It's overwrought, and, and I'm sure that a lot of people will disagree. But I find myself as a very melancholy individual. I go deep into, um, into a world where it, it can be very dark. Mm -hmm. It can be very dark. But I pick up the phone, and I call my girlfriend, Gisela, who is also a writer, a poet, an artist. And I know, I know that the current will not be as dark, that there is a lifeboat out there for me. I moved my stool up so I wasn't, so I could see it. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, about process? Yeah. What sparks the creativity, and how do you work those raw materials into the final form? Um, I'm still kind of figuring that out. It's mostly it has to do with figuring out what blocks have kind of been put in place, like mm -hmm. internal judgments or um, walls that have been built through various habits or ways that our society doesn't necessarily like allow for a, a keeping and a developing of creativity, like mm -hmm. from a young age. So the last like number of years that I've been a musician, there's been a lot of um, working on figuring out like what are the things that are keeping me from just being because that just kind of being usually turns into creation and so mm. like what I did tonight was improvised most of my solo work is improvised and then all of the songs that I've written usually come from an improvisation so like I'll be rambling so to speak I'm a bit of a <laughs> verbal processor so like <laughs> if I'm like having a hard time about something I'll just like talk out loud about it usually to my partner or sometimes to myself and my music is kind of the same way like if I can get in a space where I'm just like rambling on an <laughs> instrument um, having a recorder on helps a lot because then I can go back and revisit those ideas and then also having a room full of people helps a lot like the, <laughs> the way that my music is changes depending on the audience because there's this like almost this like weird sort of communication that happens and it's it's fun. Yeah, usually emotions are at the core of it, I think. Great. And so, yeah, learning how to sit with something and just exist in it and then, like, let these sort of, like, trained muscles just, like, m move without my brain telling them what to do mm -hmm. is usually the best thing I can do for my creativity. I'm really glad you brought up obstacles. I wonder if you'd be willing to give me an example of, like, one thing you needed to uproot in order to tap into that creative flow, if you can think of one? I mean, the biggest one was the, the belief that I had for a long time that I wasn't creative. Mm -hmm. Like from early childhood up until like six years ago, if you'd asked me, I just would have been like, no, I'm not creative. Like I'm not, I couldn't be a songwriter. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, oh man, what was the biggest obstacle? Um, it, well, I guess that belief eventually, you know, whatever it was, that led to the development of that belief. That's all hy hypothesis. But eventually what became the biggest obstacle was that belief. And so breaking that down, um, a, a, it was a lot of judgment, a lot of like boxes. Mm -hmm. There's these weird boxes your brain like can put around everything um, and they limit your like movement. Mm -hmm. Like, um, cause you don't know what a song's gonna be when it's just a baby. And if you try to make it something you think it should be, mm -hmm you might be putting it into a box that's not the shape it actually is and then it never gets to grow up. Mm -hmm. So there's just this like kind of trying to be like a good mom to my song children. Not project my insecurities onto them too much. <laughs> and then see what they want to be when they grow up. And yeah. like, like all I can do is ask to lend a hand and that mm -hmm. helps a lot. If I can step into a place of like I'm just lending a hand to this thing that like isn't me, it just passes through me and it, it makes every all the doors so much more open. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Sonia, do you also find like obstacles in your work and how do you uproot them? Mm -hmm. Well, I got on a plane in February 2019 to see a father that I had not spoken to in 25 years. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was in Denver, I got stuck in Denver and met three um, former abusive women and ended up in a conversation with them and then got on the plane and met another woman that was sitting next to her. She, goes, she asked me, where are you going? And I said, to San Antonio, what's there? My father that I've not seen. Well, I had seen him, but we've not spoken in 25 years. Um, 
I walked into his room because he was in hospice at the time, and um, he couldn't believe that I was there. He thought it was his imagination. And he asked um, my uncle and my cousins, is, is that Sonia? Is she in the room? Is she here? He thought it was his imagination, and um, my uncle said, she's here, she's standing in front of you. And he said, oh, my, Sonia, what's wrong? What happened? Why are you here? And, and I said that I, that I had come to ask him to forgive me for breaking his heart. And he said, no, no, you need to forgive me for breaking yours and your mother's heart and the family. I knew at that moment, I knew at that moment my movie was complete. I had gone home to make peace with a memory that was so painful. It had taken me five years to complete this film. But I couldn't complete it because it was, um, it's a beautiful story about love, but I had so much anger and frustration and disappointment with my father that I could not complete the film. And I felt embarrassed mm -hmm. that I had not completed it. It caused me a lot of grief. But the minute I got on, my, on the plane back to Idaho, I detox all of March. Many of you know. <laughs> I detox March and then I called my film crew out of LA flew them in, interviewed me, then I filmed, I brought in another film crew out of Utah, and then uh, my editor flew in, and on June the 27th at 2 o'clock in the morning, my film was done. And the birth certificate. Yes. Yeah, the birth, yeah, exactly. The birth certificate. I had a baby at 2 o'clock in the morning on 27th, a five-year-old baby. And it was painful. <laughs> but boy, when that baby popped out, I saw it on TV and I was like, I was, it was beautiful. And I could not have done this work as great as it has been without the love and the support of a very good man, my husband, Freddie. Yeah. And all my girlfriends. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, Sonia, this might be a good segue, since yes. we're talking about the film, to introduce our other guests. Um, Melissa and Emily, would you be willing to introduce them so we can incorporate them into the conversation? Well, um, Representative Melissa Winthrow, I've known her since 2001 or two. At least. At least. Uh, she was the director of the Women's Center at Boise State University when I showed up at her door and told her that I was creating the Women of Color Alliance and would she help? Would she guide me? Would she assist me? And she you was... no help. <laughs> you know, I, I did. I did. I just pretended I did. But it was a wonderful relationship and uh, it's been a relationship ever since. A very strong one. And Melissa has been at the forefront of women's issues, uh, human and civil rights activists, as well as um, working on, on gun control. Um, she's fabulous. I, I, there isn't anything that I can say about Melissa that has not already been said mm -hmm. in our community. <laughs> Just, and um, I want to say something. When we were cutting her film, she was sitting and facing me, and I took a picture of her, and when I saw the, there was a, um, somebody had drawn something for her and wrote the word, President. Oh, and when we were editing her film, That's I told my editor, highlight that word, President. It was one of the pages. Yes, it was that. one of the and and she's sitting there, so when you see the movie, you're gonna see the word president. We highlighted that word. And I said, never know, we could have a woman president out of Idaho. If we had a woman that declared war against the United States government, Ooh, Amy right. tries, we can have a president. <laughs> yes. Yes. And of course, I've known Emily for a very, very long time. Um, an activist, community activist. Emily has been at the forefront of many, many powerful issues, women's issues, gender issues, uh, LBGT, transgender, and at the words. And um, Emily is also a member of WOCA and was at our 20th anniversary. You came to support us. And um, 
I know these women. I, I mean, I've broken bread with them. Um, we've talked about issues, and we're at the Capitol working together. It's been a very impactful, as I knew you when you were 19 and you were arrested when I was at the Capitol, too, Amanda. <laughs> I remember that. I was not arrested because I was a director of Wogan. I was getting grants. I didn't get arrested. <laughs> I, I, wa I watched you, and I was very happy that you were there getting arrested. <laughs> I knew Sonia was going to throw that in. <laughs> Uh, well, I wanted to kind of come back to the question of obstacles because I do feel like um, the very fact that we all exist in the roles we are in today is because we have been smashing obstacles yes. all of our lives. And so what are the obstacles that you have faced and how have you uprooted those as they have shown up in your activism and in your lives? Can you talk a little, a little bit about that? I don't know who wants to go first. Do you want me to go first? Sure, go first. Go first. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would just like to say this whole event is a miracle to me, and mm -hmm. here's why. Um, from the musical artist, he's talking about the spontaneity and the improvisation of life. I, I just, it resonated with me because I feel like for my whole life growing up, people were saying, you should be goal-directed, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. But really, it was the beauty of when I relaxed and was just willing to um, accept opportunity and walk through doors without fear and with fear. Um, and that the world opened up to me, is that just being present, and I think that was my whole relationship with my mother in particular when she was passing, is she taught me so much to be present. And I think the obstacle, again, it's just it's just how beautiful how things work out, but to hear Sonia talk about her story and the obstacle resonated with me because I don't think it was until I forgave my father truly that I became a loving and compassionate person because I held on so tightly to anger and hate and when my mother was dying in fact I was caring for her every day. I lived in a hospital room and slept on a tiny little bench and the only break I took was to go home and take a shower and maybe go running to reduce stress and then come back. And I remember kind of having it out one day with my dad, like, you know, why aren't you here? Why aren't you helping? And for the first time, I think I saw him as a human being um, who was incapable of doing what I was asking him. And I just remember just a wash of forgiveness. And I think my whole life did change. Um, and I, and it dawned on me because of my mother's dying. You know, she taught me, you choose how to show up every minute of your life, no matter what you face and what the obstacles are put in front of you, and you control whether you're at peace mm -hmm. and with love and compassion or not. And it, it was a true, I think that obstacle of tightening and control and hate and anger, really giving, surrendering, and watching my mother surrender to the the pain and allowing for me to care for her reminded me of I need to surrender mm. and just walk into things. So it's an incredible story. It reminds me of how, like, I believe that you know the we live in a very um, patriarchal and you know masculine world yeah. and all that drive and you know get it done yes. and the goals and your story is just reminding me about how I think the feminine power which hasn't you know really had a chance to take hold yet is the that that presence and that mm. holding space and that that being yeah. and that waiting and that also caretaking and um, walking with our elders and our parents as they age and pass on and that's part of our divine work that we um, seem to be I mean, if I could share one other thing, I pa when my mom passed away, I was the only person in the room, mm -hmm. and I was so happy about mm -hmm. it. And the melancholy, the melancholy you talked about is that deep, deep feeling. It is what it is. There's not good, it's not bad, it's not ugly, but to recognize when it's in your face, mm -hmm. to just be with it. Um, that was one of the most powerful moments in my life, to yes. be with her when she passed. And I think when I came back to work 10 days later, silly me, but everybody asked, you know, how are you? And I said, you know, everything has changed. And I was so present. I was so present. Nothing mattered but the person in front of me. Mm -hmm. And time was changed. I can't even describe it, maybe if you've lost them. When, Time has changed forever. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Thanks for letting me share that. Yes, thank you. Thank you for being so willing to be open. Yes, I'm up. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm Emily Jackson at me. Um, I, I guess my path to womanhood is really untraditional. And, but I think that makes it all the more valuable to me. Um, <clears throat> my mother never got to know me as Emily, and uh, and I lament that. And, and I was uh, I was her caregiver in the last three or four years of her life. So um, so um, so that was really difficult for me, but it allowed me to connect even deeper. Um, my mother was a, a very strong woman, um, uh, very disciplinary and very, very straightforward. Um, um, my father was a very gentle man, it, uh, but in our household, um, uh, when my father spoke, we all stood at attention, even, even my mother. And um, so I learned a lot from my mother. I learned patience. Um, um, I learned to be strong in my opinions. Um, I learned um, uh, how to love uh, unconditionally, and uh, so I uh, hope I carry that through, you know, in, in my life. Um, and I really think that a lot of today, um, what I can share with my daughter is that's really where my story is. Mm -hmm. is my relationship with my adult daughter and hopefully that her stories um, sitting on this couch here will reflect that um, so um, so people may not know but I'm the T in the LGBT alphabet soup and and so I, I identify as a, a transsexual woman of um, transgender experience and I identify as a woman um, I always have, um, but in my generation it was pretty difficult to do that. Um, so my relationship with my mother, um, to her probably was more of a, a, a mother-daughter or a mother-son, but to me it was always a mother-daughter. Um, I used to, um, my mother was not a saint by any means, but um, and she had her faults in, uh, like we all do. Um, I. Um, I have learned a lot from her, and and, and she has made me who I am today. Um, I I usually lament. I, I got some great stories about her too, but mm -hmm. how she, her relationship with me. Um, but um, I'm sure, where I'm going to go with this now. Um, <laughs> um, in the moment. Yeah, in the moment. <laughs> so, um, I wonder if you want to talk at all about obstacles that you have faced and how you have circumvented yeah. them, confronted them, or uprooted them right. in your life. Well, my identity, I knew my identity when I was a real young, young boy, and it didn't take that boy very long to understand that to act outside the gender norm is to invite ridicule and violence. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so you always, I always put my gender identity away, um, but it never goes away. You know, just, just stuck back in that deep recesses of my closet, but it never goes away. And, um, and um, so that those are the obstacles I had to deal with. And, and typical with, with uh, people like me, um, I ended up trying to be the best man that I could be. Um, almost an uber male in the sports that I played and the, and, and the um, uh, uh, in the job that I had, very testosterone heavy environment, uh, military obligation. Um, I was a church deacon in a very fundamentalist Christian church. Um, I was a, uh, married for 37 years. Um, uh, father, two children, uh, have four grandchildren and, and two great-grandchildren now. Um, uh, my daughter lives here with in, in the same city that, with me now, and I spend as much time as I can with her. Um, it's a great relationship. Um, 
so so the obstacles I had to have had to overcome were many, um, and a lot of times I didn't think about my gender feelings um, until I was alone. So uh, my presence to the world was what was expected, and um, but it was like living an uncomfortable life. You know, I feel I was probably an okay father, an okay son, an okay. Um, uh, lover, okay friend, um, but in reality that really wasn't who I was and so it made it really difficult. So just trying to overcome those and I think some of my interpersonal relationships probably were, were, were hurt over the years because of that because um, you know I had a deep dark secret and I wouldn't let people get close to me and, um, and, that, uh, and that's really sad. So, um, after my mother passed away is when I truly started to um, come to grips with my identity. And um, it got to the point where um, I had two choices to make. One is to welcome death um, or to, uh, to face my demons is what I call it. And, and so, so I, I made a choice and I started down this path. And, um, and there, in our society, there's a lot of obstacles uh, to overcome. And I, I take on every one of those obstacles with vigor. Um, I live uh, true and authentically in uh, who I am. Um, I live with dignity, honor, and with grace. And, um, and I got that from my mother. So um, I welcome her for that. So. So I still face those obstacles, and that's why I do what I do in my social justice activism. And um, prior, prior to my transition, I never thought about activism whatsoever. Um, a good friend of mine, um, Nikki Leonard, at, uh, about 15 years ago said, you know, I'm going to make you an activist. And I go, what? <laughs> you know? And so I, I really came into my advocacy work and my activism as a reluctant activist. Right. And, um, you know, I've been called an upstander, which is really important to me um, in, um, in what I do. When I see things are wrong, then, then I'll, I'll approach those with vigor and try to make change. Um, it's not easy. Um, sometimes I, I get burnt out, um, feel like I'm getting burnt out. But, being retired the way I am um, now, um, you know, I can take time for myself and, and I can read a book and I can snuggle with the dog and, and you I'm know, those type of things. I'm so glad you brought up burnout because that was yeah. one of the questions I had was sort of how do we, mm -hmm. as artists, as activists, as women facing, you know, this world that still, we don't run. Be honest. Yeah. <laughs> we get to do so much more yeah. than the women who came before us, whose shoulders we sit on. But um, there's still so much that we don't have control yeah. over. And um, you know, I'm just curious about people's self-care rituals and how do you replenish and how do you keep that cup full? And I don't know. Well, Riley, we can come back that. to you or circle back <laughs> to the side. Um, I sleep a lot. <laughs> That's I think my main. I used to be. Um, back when I was in school and when I was younger and I was very, it had kind of been ingrained in me to be very goal driven, very like, not present, but very like success and, and goal driven. And um, I didn't sleep very much as uh, a way to try to meet the, these goals that had kind of been passed down to me and it did a, a lot of damage. Well, there were other things too, but so I think one of the main things I do is, and I'm fortunate to be able to do this. I'm really fortunate to, you know, my cost of living is low enough currently, and I like can kind of scrounge around and get a enough of my needs met through with a, a small enough amount of time that I, for the last few years, have been able to prioritize rest and sleep and, um, you know, my busy spells now like max out at like three, four weeks instead of like five, six, seven. Like, w you know, when am I going to get a break? And then mm -hmm. you, the, the amount of time it takes for you to recover when you've been going 
so so hard that your body can't process like can't handle it the the farther you go without taking a break like the longer it takes to recover mm -hmm. and I kind of learned that the hard way a few years ago so since then I've just I mean that boundary kind of drew itself honestly like <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a little bit it was just like nope you you need to clear out your schedule for November and like not I don't you know mm -hmm. but yes yeah, so sleep and rest I think are my biggest self-care things mm -hmm. I'm a driver Driver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Driving is relaxing for you. I love yeah. to drive. Wow. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> go to driving <laughs> to Bonner's Ferry, mm -hmm. which typically can take 12 to 13 hours mm -hmm. if you don't stop for a bathroom break. And I'm not into depends, so I have to, <laughs> <laughs> I have to stop for, for a bathroom break. But I'm a driver. I love to drive. I enjoy driving. I can get up any time at 4, 4.30 in the morning and just go for a beautiful drive and find myself actually, I've been really blessed. I, I just drive everywhere. And I've actually been able to witness um, some incredible events taking place at, at, at restaurants. You know, seeing uh, an old man walking in in his overalls, a farmer, an old farmer, in his overalls, hunched over, barely walking, getting his coffee, and seeing that he and I are both in a very odd way, almost similar, we're tired. Mm -hmm. You know, we both feel hunched, we both feel tired. Um, I'm sure he hears the stories from the land, mm -hmm. and I hear the stories from the women. And uh, this, this morning, um, somebody sent me a couple of pictures from the newspaper, and I couldn't stop crying because the emotion that came to me was the collective stories that I had collected mm -hmm. in three states. And I happened to be in my car driving. And I parked on the side, I parked in the parking lot and just had a, a very healthy cry, which is really critical and important. Because um, I came from a family where crying was not permitted. You know, only sissies and babies cry. And so I came from a military background, a military brat. I grew up all over the world. I grew up on the toughest playground. And people say New York is tough. Grew up on a military playground. Mm -hmm. You got kids from Tennessee, Alabama, um, New York, Texas, California. They're tough. Those are tough kids. And you didn't cry on the playground. So I didn't cry at home, and I didn't cry on the playground. And there was a lot bottled up. So I, as I became older, as a young woman, I'd get in my car and I'd, I'd cry and cry and cry so people couldn't see me cry. But something happened in, in Boise, Idaho. <laughs> and I told my, my girlfriend, Terry, the story. I'm in downtown Boise thinking, okay, I can have a good cry. <laughs> I'm at a red light and I'm doing the ugly cry. <laughs> and there's like stuff coming out of my nose. And I'm, like, <laughs> and I'm crying and crying. And then there, I notice, I feel like someone's looking at me. And I turn over, and there are two women filmmakers. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> and I go, oh my God, it's going to be out there. The song of a sorry went berserk and crazy and started <laughs> wiping her boobs away from her face and the blah, blah. And I said, it's okay. I can cry. Mm -hmm. I have every right to cry. I hear some of the most incredible stories in the state of Idaho. Only because I get in my car and I drive there to Doug Valley, Fort Hall, Blackfoot, Pocatello, Rupert, Rexburg, you name it. I mean, there hasn't been a woman I haven't slept with in the state of Idaho. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I slept with grandmothers, I've slept with aunties, I've slept on the couch, I've slept, I slept with a grandmother. <laughs> and hearing the stories firsthand, hearing the stories firsthand, and getting in my car and crying all the way from Blackfoot to Twin Falls is so healthy. Mm -hmm. And now I literally cry with people at, at, at when I'm having dinner. I never used to. I never used to cry. Well, don't get any tinted glass on those. Videos. I know. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I think it's another myth of like toxic masculinity that we're not supposed to have feelings or emote or that somehow 
repressing those emotions is better doesn't make any sense to me anymore, really. Yeah. I also used to never cry. And then around the same time I started like being creative or like allowing my creativity, I also started like allowing my emotions mm. to probably go very much hand in hand. I cry all the time now. And <laughs> I think it's the I can't imagine getting through life without crying yeah, anymore. Like, me too. It's me so too. healthy. It is healthy. It's good. Someone recently told me that you know, the structure of your tears um, when you cry is different if it's grief or happiness or has the serotonin or the hormones that you're releasing are like actually in your tears. So they're literally releasing and have different structure based on your release. I believe that. I want to make sure we hear from both uh, self-care and filling your cup back up, especially, I mean, working in the legislature and that must be very depleting. Well, um, I love hard work. And I think it's from my mother, who was a workhorse. She was born in the 1929 in the Great Depression, mm -hmm. middle child of 12. Oh, wow. And I remember I went home to visit her when she was passing. She, we didn't know she was sick, but I got there. She's 82. That day, she's out in the garden on her shovel in her tube top. <laughs> 82 year old woman in her tube top. And, uh, I kid you not. I kid you not. And uh, the next day, she was she was struck ill. So I mean, I to replenish, I value hard work. I trained for an Ironman, and it taught me discipline and every single day to do something. So um, I I love that hard feeling of working hard and then just release. Go into the woods and not see a single person. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was from her that every day, how do I find a sense of peace? And if I can't find that every day, then what good is life? <laughs> you know, and if I can't enjoy the people across from me or find some magic and love and sense in the moment I'm in. Even even today, or not today, but yesterday, I was in the foothills with this foster dog, and I just thought, wow, here I am today. I'm able to run. It's a beautiful day. Nothing special. What a miracle. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think for me, replenishing is just remembering every day being present as much as I can. Um, and I mean, like I said, I think balance is something different for everyone, but I just, I love hard work mm. and um, welcome it. And uh, sometimes my husband teases me, like, if I'm like, gosh, I didn't, I wasn't productive today, mm. you know, like, <laughs> just take a nap. <laughs> um, and there is beauty in that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, there is beauty in that, but I do, I love to be sweating and, mm -hmm. yeah. Sweating is a good release. Yeah, I love yeah. it. <laughs> well, I think that we need to take a little break, okay. um, like eight minutes, and we'll give you a little warning when it's time to come back, and we'll resume our conversation. I love it. Eight yeah. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to start, but since Christian brought up the comedy show, um, you know, for me as an activist and as an artist who writes a lot from an emotional space, I, I feel like I need outlets to bring me like joy and laughter and levity. And we kind of touched on some of this. Uh, so for me, I often turn to like to comedy or to the outdoors or to nature. And I just wonder if you would share like when was the last time you had a belly laugh and, and, and what brings you that joy? And or, what brings you that, that joy in your life? And how do you dance and play with the lighter side of life, even as we face uh, so many challenges in the world around us? You want to start, Emily? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I don't know that I've had a belly laugh in quite a while. But um, I have gotten back into skiing, and I, uh, thanks to my daughter. But, uh, um, and I, to me, that's a great release. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to play bagpipes and um, mm -hmm. uh, for about 17 years. I used to teach and compete and perform, mm -hmm. and, um, and that was a, quite a release too. <coughs> it was really a passion, and and then I've gotten away from that, so I miss that. But but uh, you gave me a belly laugh at our meeting <laughs> last week, talking <laughs> about playing the bagpipes. <laughs> to a certain person. Would you be willing to share that story? They edit it out for the radio, so if it's not appropriate, they'll cut it. Oh. Will you tell us about the bagpipes for <laughs> Helen? 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 oh. <laughs> we, were, we were talking about politicians and, and, and one in particular, uh, Helen Chenoweth, as, and some of you may know who that was. God rest was. her soul. God rest her soul, yes. <laughs> and, and after she retired from, from Congress, uh, she's still active in her party and, and respected in her party. And, um, and she had a birthday party uh, down at the Grove, uh, quite well attended. Um, and so they wanted a piper to pipe her in to happy birthday. And so I did that. And so, so I piped Helen Chinowith in, in to happy birthday. She went up on the stage, and as she got up on the stage, I just went into the old gray mare. And, oh. <laughs> and I think it took people a while to, to you know, put the two together. And then they got a little bit of a laugh out of it. Too. And then, I, then I left. And then I just stood around. <laughs> I feel like sometimes it's a little acts of resistance, you know, like the little ways that we can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to say the la um, I belly laugh all the time because my husband is the funniest person on the planet. Uh -huh. He could say the sky is blue and I would start laughing. I mean, he was sharing something with me today and I was guffawing. So I am blessed to have a husband who is an amazing cook and it just makes me laugh all the time. <laughs> Anyone to share? Um, I just got a new roommate and we've been laughing a lot a lot since getting that new roommate. I, we just have like similar enough senses of humor and we've been joking about writing, he's a musician, he's the drummer in one of my bands so it's me and my partner and him and we've been joking about writing these like silly little joke songs and so like um, so apparently sometimes I talk like in a sing-song voice, I'll just say something and then I'll hear him like sing it back to me <laughs> in like <laughs> the pitches that I sang it at. He's like yeah sometimes I just try to like figure out the intervals of like the, the stuff you say like like third sixth fourth i don't know so <laughs> like, um we've been r pretend r writing maybe someday there'll be real songs on youtube who knows like yeah. these like weird joke songs um <coughs> and i've been laughing a lot the last little bit because of that That's <laughs> awesome I love weird joke songs, like taking uh -huh. regular songs and like making fake lyrics to them uh -huh. is like one of my personal hobbies and so whatever the song, like Weird Al, you know, like I, I could have made a million dollars being Weird Al, but I came too late, so. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so what do you, where well, do you find joy? In I, I recently had a conversation with a friend a few days ago about my mother dying and I was laughing really hard. I know this is weird. But my mother would say things to me while she was dying. And it would catch me off guard. Like, one example was my mother had to wear a gas mask when she was dying. And she sounded like Darth Vader. <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm sitting next to her and she's got her mask on, she's like, Sister! And she called me sister. Is my social security in the bank? And I said, Yes, don't worry, I got it all. Don't worry about anything. Is there enough money in the bank? And I said, yes, yes, don't worry. Good, go get some money and dye your hair. You're depressing me. <laughs> <laughs> She's dying. She's not going to dye my hair. I'm depressing her. But if you can picture this, a little bubble came out of my head because her kidneys had stopped functioning and she looks like a little blowfish. Oh. And I said, listen, you little blowfish, you're depressing me too. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't say it. <laughs> I just thought it. Oh, she knows it now. Yeah, she knows it now. <laughs> <laughs> but those, I mean, I, I, really, I, I couldn't stop laughing the other day because I was sharing with a friend everything she'd say to me. And it was always about, she was a Texas girl. And you know, they're always about beauty and makeup and oh, the hair. Oh, and oh, if I could share real quick. <laughs> yes, My mother was so ill and I would take care of her at home <laughs> and I had dropped her. And at this point I had to get her back to the hospital. So the paramedics are on the way. My dad's running around because he can't do anything. And my uncle comes up to the gate. And my mom's like, look, get my makeup bag immediately. And I'm like, we're going to the hospital. The paramedics are coming. 
I need my lipstick. <laughs> so here's my mom trying to get her lipstick on. Oh my my uncle's trying to leave. I'm like, little man, you walk out of there right now. I'm not kill you. Don't you move. I'm trying to get her makeup on. Breathe <laughs> oh my dad. But all that while well, she's so sick. Like, she's dying. Wait, did you have to have your makeup on? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes you have to laugh at something that is so incredibly painful. But I mean, I send that email out to I think 50 women and it went viral. People were just laughing that my mother wanted, I mean, she's literally dying. And I'm, she's asking me But your description of Darth Vader. Darth Vader. <laughs> Sister. <laughs> I, I want to come back to something you said, Emily, about taking like an unconventional path towards womanhood. And that really struck a chord with me um, not only because I, I, I resonate with that. I feel like I took an unconventional path towards femininity and really claiming that. And I kind of shared about you know that idea of being so driven. And I was also kind of a tomboy and wearing like um, men's clothing and hanging out with all guys in high school and really just claiming that part of myself. And I kind of feel like it was partly my queer identity that I hadn't ident you know discovered yet, but also. Um, a, a grasp at power because I could see in the landscape of things even as a young woman that to be masculine meant to be powerful and I wanted some of that for myself and I really didn't allow myself to be feminine until I came out of the closet um, which I felt like I had to leave Idaho to do so I also feel like you're a very courageous individual to continue that process here um, and I just, I kind of wanted to open up the conversation to those, those unconventional paths. Like, how how have we all gotten to? How have you gotten to the place that you are today? And what were the, the side trips or the discoveries that you made in that process? Um, I I didn't transition to be a real woman. Um, I'll put question mark marks around that. I, transi I transitioned to be a woman. And my kind of woman, the kind of woman I want to be, um, a whole person um, uh, who challenges stereotypes as much as caters to them. So um, that's just who I am. And, um, you know, I had a, a good example in my mother. Um, on on uh, how she expressed her femininity and her power. And um, so I think I own some of that. Uh, I own some of that in my heart, um, uh, who she is. And hopefully I pass it along to my daughter. Um, my daughter uh, has got a story probably much more um, dynamic than mine <laughs> in, in how she um, um, expressed her feminine, femininity and not her feminine, femininity and, and how she has grown and, and, and the things that she does too. I mean, she's a welder and, you know, and a yoga instructor and a, you know, and a, a shred Betty and a, I mean, there's so many different things that she's done and, and, and I, I'm always amazed at, uh, at where she is and the things that she's done, I'm going, wow. <laughs> but um, so, so yeah, my path to womanhood, of course, it had a, um, uh, I consider trans. I consider transition a linear thing. It has a kind of a, a beginning point, and it has what I consider an end, an end point. And so, and I've gone through that transitional process and. And so now I, I just try to work on my womanhood, whatever that is, and um, and how I define that for myself, and, um, and, and and what's important to me. Um, and I hope I'm being a good example. I, I try to be a mentor. I, um, you know, I, I take pleasure in and and working with uh, other um, trans siblings. Uh, through their difficulties, uh, um, that gives me pleasure. Um, I, uh, my activism is um, uh, fills my cup, 
uh, but it also empties my cup mm -hmm. too. And, and, and um, so the things that I do uh, in my activism and the, the boards that I'm on and, um, and uh, the committees that I'm on, um, uh, uh, it, it's really strange how you get on those too. You just show up and you, you, you do things and then before you know it you're on a committee, you're on a board, you're doing <laughs> this, you know. And, um, um, yeah. Huh? I was trying to get her to run for she's a political office. She's trying to get her to run for a political office. Yes. yes. Keep telling keep yes. telling yes. she's lazy, but <laughs> it's a lot of work and, you know, I you guys I can't know how you do it sometimes. But uh, um, <laughs> and you know, a good friend Nicole the Favor, um, back in twenty it was probably two thousand and eight or maybe. It was when she was in uh, probably a representative, and and af after the session was over with, she came up to me and um, she said, I'm really angry at you. And I go, why would you be angry at me? And she says, I found out you don't live in my district. <laughs> and I said, Nicole, I, I grew up in your district. I used to own property in your district, but now I'm in 16 instead of 19. She said, yeah, I found that out. She said, it was towards the end of a, the session, she says, I wanted you to I was going to be gone. I wanted you to sit in for me in the legislature, Aww. and I said, "Holy smokes!" I said, "You really want me to do that?" She says, "Yeah, those those gray hair so and sos you know, they <laughs> absolutely you need to know that there's other people in this state that that um, um, and and so so that was kind of an interesting conversation that I had with her back then, and uh, but but I I never really considered any type of a, of a an office, and I, I used to think, just who the hell would vote for me, you know, type of. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who are listening to this later, there's a lot of hands yeah. up. <laughs> so, so anyway, well, thank you so much. But, um, but yeah, activism is is um, an advocacy work. It's just it's big, and and you know, this is the first year that I've really spent a lot of time down at the the legislature, and especially towards the end, and it was just like every day and and um, I'm going wow this is crazy and, and I'll give uh, you my Zen Buddhist cards <laughs> <laughs> so and I and I'll probably be down there a lot this next year too so <laughs> unconventional paths I'll quickly say um, I I can't believe that I ran for office somebody suggested I do it I thought oh what do I have to offer but I think my unconventional path honestly when I look back is I could never take a bully and I think that was, um, you ask any, I remember vividly Brent Baird and David Schilling making Laura Rushton cry, and I inadvertently grabbed Brent to stop it and broke his arm. Inadvertently. <laughs> my bridges, picking a fight, broke my lunchbox. John Dell, who was not letting girls get on the kickball team, wound up in a creek behind the school. <laughs> I love it. I mean, Susie Jackson broke my nose. I mean, the list goes on. But I think, honestly, I just couldn't take a bully. Now I learned how to deal with my aggression and anger at the bully. Um, but I think that's probably what brought me to um, advocacy work. I work with victims of sexual assault. And honestly, that took the um, that bullish spirit away, being present with somebody who has been through trauma. You put all of your own baggage aside and be present and embrace whatever space that person needs and how they need to tell their story. But I think that's what really brought me to public service is that I just could not take a bully. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. Sorry, Brent Bear. We did go to prom together. <laughs> <laughs> there was a resolution yeah. <laughs> in the end. Yes. Sonia, how about you? I mean, growing up in the military, it's pretty unconventional to end up in activism. How did you, how did you end up there? Well, I will have to say her name. I've never found her. Her name was Mayoshi Carter. And um, she was a black little girl that w had brothers and sisters, 11 brothers and sisters. And I got beat up on the playground. I'd just come to Italy, Aviano Air Force Base. And I'd, ne I'd always gone to Catholic girls' school. So I'm on the playground, and I, this is true, on a military base, you're marked. You're new and you're marked. Mm -hmm. And if you get beat up, you got to fight back. Well, I didn't fight back. I cried. I ran to the restroom. 
Somebody walked into the restroom. I was hiding in the bathroom stall and I was crying. I had gotten beat up by this really big girl and um, I was sitting in the restroom stall, I was crying and I heard somebody walk in and I got, I got really quiet because I didn't want anybody to know I was there. And all of a sudden somebody's banging on my door to open it up and I refused. I said, I, I can't, I'm, you know, I can't open it up. And, and all of a sudden a little girl's face comes underneath and I'm looking <laughs> underneath I'm like, she goes, open this door. So she slides back out, I open the door and she says, what happened to you? I said, I got beat up on the playground. And she said, who beat you up? And I said, I don't know, some, some, some big girls beat me up. She goes, well, let's go out. So we went out. Now, I did not know that I was with one of the toughest girls mm -hmm. on the playground who beat up not just the girls, but the boys. <laughs> Everybody. John Dell, Mike Bridges. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I point to that girl and I said, that's the girl that beat me up. And she goes, you got to beat her up tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, I'm not going to beat her up because her friends are going to beat me up. And I said, you, she said, you got to beat her up. She went home with me and as we're walking home because, um, well, she just wanted to tell me how I was going to fight. So she's punching the air like Muhammad Ali. <laughs> and she goes, punch me in the stomach. I punch her in the stomach. She goes, you hit like a girl. She punches me, knocks me, <laughs> knocks the wind out of me and says, if you don't beat that girl tomorrow, I will beat you up. And you're going to be marked and you'll be beat up every day. And I said, I've never fought in my life. She goes, I'm going to teach you. When that girl has her back turned and she's talking and she's talking to her friends, you're going to go and you're going to knee her. She, fall, she <laughs> kneels down and you're going to jump on her and you're going to be punching her. I said, her friends are going to beat me up. She goes, not while I'm standing there. <laughs> that little girl, even though I did not want to fight, what she taught me about fighting was not about beating up somebody. It was standing up and setting something for the rest of your life. Mm. I never got beat up again, and I've never been beat up again. Mm. And um, she was 11 years old, and she told me this. I've never forgotten it. She said, if you don't beat up the bully the first time, you're going to have several bullies in your life because mm -hmm. they see the fear and smell it on you. And um, growing up on, uh, being a military brat, I think made me probably one of the best grassroots organizers because I see everything. I hear it, see it, watch it, and I don't walk away from confronting or addressing the issue right then and there. And so um, I think being a military brat really um, motivated me to take on some really greater issues as a grassroots organizer and probably gave me the, the initiative and the motivation to um, create the Women of Color Alliance because there were some organizations that didn't want that organization to, to be created. Mm -hmm. You know, fear is that um, I think Idaho has a limitation on money, especially around the nonprofit foundation money. And here comes the Women of Color Alliance. Women of color, Latinas and Native Americans sitting at the table talking about gender and race. And some organizations, I believe, were a little nervous mm -hmm. about us taking their money. Mm -hmm. And that's a reality. It's not a fallacy. Mm -hmm. It's not a story. It's truth. But I think taking that on, mm -hmm. I had to have, I had to have that, that confrontation on that playground mm -hmm. in order to build the Women of Color Alliance in Idaho. Well, we would have friends on the playground. Well, <laughs> we would have friends, friends, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Bradley, do you want to add anything to the unconventional mm. journey, pathway? Uh, maybe like two small things. I resonate with what you said about being very like boyish in high school. I think um, you know, in fifth and sixth grade, I chopped on my hair. If I only wore boys' clothes, my name is androgynous, Riley. Like people would mistake me as a boy, and I'd just get this like flourish of like, ha ha! They don't know I'm a girl, <laughs> yeah. so they won't treat me differently because mm. of it. Because you can feel like, uh, you know, that they're just opportunities that are. You know, I used to like resent having the door held open for me and like things like that. And I eventually sort of outgrew the the tomboyishness and felt comfortable expressing more femininity. 
and then um, yeah so I just resonated with that and then musically I mean, I, you know, I started playing the harp a few years ago. I, I started playing music professionally, I think, like four years ago. So I kind of feel like I took a little bit of an unconventional route to, to becoming a musician. There were just some weird little roundabout, roundabout paths to me getting to where I am. Like when I was in college, I was in college for biochemistry and um, I dropped out and like three months after I dropped out I got like my first gig at um, I, like I bought a keyboard and got my first gig and um, everything's kind of like catapulted from from there mm -hmm. yeah <coughs> well yeah <laughs> I think it might be time for a poem music combo mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if y'all are ready to get that yeah. set up oh, it's me <coughs> Oh gosh, I'm not sitting on your glasses. It's okay, they're still good. Yeah. <laughs> Put it on my glasses since you did, AJ. <laughs> I didn't say what year it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think. I mean, the other thing I would say, Sonia, is like you have not changed a bit. You could still feel. I mean, what I what I remember is like Sonia was in the room. And it was known. Like your presence was there, sparkling, <laughs> alive, <laughs> sassy, yeah. and you knew Sonia was there. Sonia was in the office. You know? <laughs> and I feel like that is still 100% present. It has not been distilled or watered down at all. And I, I love that so much. And I'm just so grateful to know you, as I'm sure many people in this room are. So. Well, Wheaties. <laughs> <laughs> As Emily throws her fan <laughs> to her girlfriend. <laughs> Let okay. us know when you're ready, Riley. I'm ready. Okay. Okay. Um, this poem is called Free and is dedicated to my mother and the women of Idaho. Le I just want to say after the poem, we're just going to transition into some closing music by Riley. Oh, my. Do you want to do that intro one more time just for recording purposes? <coughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Again? Mm -hmm. This poem is called Free, for the, for, dedicated to my mother, Gloria, and for the women of Idaho. Okay? Victorian age was she, kept in a headlock so she could not see. <laughs> Along came her daughter and said, No, 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 we must be set afree. Victorian age was she. Now, happily, mother and daughter, they do now see. With a voice that is oh so sweet and free. Victorian age was she. Upon a journey that one did not see the freedom of oh so many mothers daughters women and girls now they see that love is the one factor in this oh so beautiful dream that freedom for one is not free until we are all set free sang all the birds and sweet
sharing with such raw um, emotion and truth and keep um, breaking barriers and breaking ground and being exactly who you are. I feel so incredibly blessed. This night has been special and so memorable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nina. Thank you. And thank you to Radio Boise. Yes. Taking your donations to the portable <laughs> projects we're working on. <laughs> and yeah, I said previously, this is the first, you know, use of their brand new sort of, I don't know, now leased space. Now leased space. So. Yes. Yeah. And 
practice New Year's Eve parties in uh, December. December, so you get some work, you know, before the actual New Year's Eve. But I guess more importantly, I, I you know, just sitting here as, as I think you all felt, this is insanely like special. Like just like I don't know the honesty and the conversation and just like ah, the intimacy of it all and just. No, the selfie of you three. I took a <laughs> selfie. Or I should say, I took, I took a picture of you taking a selfie of you three on the couch. I have to tell you, my it's mother so took great. photos. Like she has a whole closet full of paper photos, so that was for her. There's a lot of them. That's great. <laughs> I know. And in the interest of, of Amanda's time, we'll get her out of here, so she's not, you know, snubbing you. She just has to see somebody Take cooler daughter. than all of us. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's pretty great. Um, or they're pretty great. So they what they prefer to feel like. Anyway, um, I just yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's basically it. And like, you can like speak to your film out in the lobby because it's opening soon and all that kind of stuff, right? Flicks. You can just give the date. Fourteenth of September at one o'clock in the afternoon, that's Saturday. Very soon. Next Saturday. That is Next very Saturday. Soon. Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. Next Saturday. Saturday. Get your tickets because it's I, nearly sold out. You say it is. It's almost sold out. Yeah. Yeah. Which is fantastic. It's and wonderful. Then Maybe we'll bring it back for oh, like yeah. like film for story I'm, for I'm it. hoping yeah. that's yes. yes. that would be really great. Yeah. So. Anyway, that conversation go, can go okay. on. And Riley, did you bring any? Uh, you were going to bring some T-shirts or something? Oh, I forgot. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have right. T-shirts. You can find me on the internet, and I'll. <laughs> we'll, we can arrange. You have any? Yeah. And yes, and when yeah, we'll be playing have sometime CDs, soon, I'm yeah. sure. So. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm actually playing October 5th at the Visual Arts Collective. Oh, awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah. With other string instrument folks. That won't be the full band, okay. um, but I am playing for a band. I'm opening for Lindsay Hunt's album release, and she has a bunch of strings in her band. It's going to be spectacular. So. Okay, at the back.